Thanks for joining me today. It's good to be with you and to have this opportunity to dig into God's word together. I encourage you, if you have a Bible with you, to open it to Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. Today we're going to look at a parable, another parable of Jesus that he told. The parable of the wedding banquet. What it meant to the original hearers and also what it means for us today. But I want to start with a question. Have you ever turned down an invitation to a party, a meal, a school dance, a wedding, or some other event? We probably all have at one time or another. Sometimes because we already have a prior commitment. I mean, let's face it. We are busy people, and we live in a culture that tells us that we must constantly be on the go. So we can't accept every invitation that's offered. But also, sometimes we just don't want to go. You know, depending on what it is, when it is, how much it costs, who else is going, and so on. For some people, like my wife, saying no is very hard to do. It used to be for me too, but I've practiced and I've gotten a lot better at it. If I can't go to something, I'm like, thanks for the invitation, but unfortunately, I just can't make it. Emily feels like she has to share the whole story of why she can't go, you know, all the details. And then she struggles to break it to them because she doesn't want anyone to be upset with her. But I love her the way she is. I mean, she couldn't say no to marrying me, right? I'm blessed and grateful. Well, the other day, I received a wedding invitation. It read, no presents, please. Your presence is itself a present. After rereading it repeatedly, no presents, please. Your presence is a present. No presents. I concluded that, in fact, I was not invited to the wedding, so I decided not to attend. Now, I'm joking about that. It didn't say that. But seriously, we were invited to a wedding recently, and we hadn't replied yet. Then it came to mind when we were packing for a trip last weekend, and Emily realized, oh, we have to let our friends know whether we're going to their daughter's wedding or not. They needed to know. And as much as we would have loved to go, we decided to decline, because it's just too far away for us to travel at the time that it's happening. Can you relate? Have you ever turned down an invitation? In Jesus' parable, it's no ordinary invitation. It's a royal wedding. And there are some shocking responses, as we'll see. This is the third parable in a sequence of closely interrelated parables that Jesus told back to back to back. It's a continuation of a scene recorded by Matthew in chapters 21 and 22, and it takes place in the temple courts. It's shortly after Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday. So this scene is early in Jesus' final week as he journeyed towards the cross, where he was crucified to pay for our sins. So it's getting urgent. Jesus has a heavy heart, not just because he knows he must suffer and die, but because he cares about these people who are missing the point. They're missing who he is and what he's doing, his mission. He is for them, but they are against him. They hate him, but he still loves them. So we have this confrontation between Jesus and the chief priests and Pharisees. Pastor Matt preached the last two weekends from this same scene, starting with when the religious leaders asked Jesus, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Now Jesus knew that they felt threatened by him. Their hearts were full of envy. They plotted to trap and kill him. So he told these three parables with the intention of convicting them of their wrongdoing. First, the parable of the two sons, then the parable of the tenants, which pastor preached on last week, and finally the parable of the wedding banquet. As pastor pointed out last week, Jesus has compassion for them. He's not trying to defeat them. 
And Luke tells us in his gospel account that as Jesus approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. He genuinely loves them and wants them to see their error, to realize the truth and repent to change their ways, and he's giving them all these chances. But despite his clear warnings of coming judgment, they harden their hearts even more against Jesus. Matthew chapter 21, verse 45 and 46 makes it clear that when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them, and they looked for a way to arrest him. But they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. In the first parable, Jesus told them pretty bluntly that the kingdom of God is passing them by, that tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you, which was a major insult for them to hear. Those dirty, rotten sinners are getting in and we're being left out? Ha! Hardly! We're the good guys, the chosen ones, the elite. We call the shots around here, not you, Jesus. Who do you think you are? Those are my words describing their attitude. And again, in the second parable, Jesus told them, Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Taken away from the self-righteous religious leaders and given to those who repent and believe. The kingdom is open to all who believe, to all people, but not all receive it because the only way in is through Jesus. And as we know, not all people accept him. In fact, most people reject him. So this third parable has a similar message. The main point is this. Everyone is invited to the great feast of heaven. So accept his generous invitation through Christ and share the invitation with others today. Sadly, many refuse him, not realizing it's the best invitation ever. So we've set it up nicely. I've even given you the conclusion so now let's look at the particulars. What's going on in this parable? It's about the kingdom again. This time we have a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. So they have the guest list, right? Just like any wedding. That can be one of the hardest parts of planning a wedding. Who to invite and where to cut off the guest list because weddings are expensive, right? But that's not a factor for this king. So the first wave of servants are sent out to tell the invited guests to come. But a strange thing happens. The guests refused to come. But the king is patient. So he sends out more servants. It's ready. Dinner is hot and ready. And it's the good stuff. The fattened cattle. Again, a bizarre response comes. Some ignored the servants by just going about their business, while the rest, and this is where it gets ugly, the rest of the invitees seized the king's servants, abused them, and murdered them. Guess how the king felt about that? He was rightly and justly enraged. So he sends in the military and destroys them. All this horrific tragedy, and yet there's still a wedding to celebrate. So the king again sends servants out, this time to the streets. Just invite everyone you see. And the wedding hall was finally filled with guests. But there's another perplexing turn. The king noticed among the guests a man violating the dress code, not wearing the proper attire. 
How did you get in without wedding clothes? The king asked. The man had no defense. He was speechless. So he was tied up and thrown out into the darkness. What does all this mean? Well, the king in this story is God the Father. And the son, the groom, is Jesus. There's no mention of a bride in the parable. And it's not like Jesus forgot to include her. I'm not trying to add to the parable, but you should know that in other parts of the Bible, the kingdom of heaven is also described as a wedding. And there is a picture of a beautiful bride. One such instance is in Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 through 9. It says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory, for the wedding of the Lamb, which is Jesus, has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen, it tells us, stands for the righteous acts of the saints. Then the angel said to me, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Notice that the fine linen was given to the bride. Her righteousness was a gift, not earned. This points us to the work of Christ to cleanse his church from her sins. In another example, Paul writes to husbands and wives in Ephesians chapter 5, saying, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Wives, you may not like the sound of that, Well, listen to the instruction for the hubbies. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. Men, lay down your lives for your wives. Ladies, how does that sound? Sacrificial love, just like Jesus. Skipping ahead a bit to verse 31, which quotes Genesis. Paul writes, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Paul says, This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. Did he catch that? Marriage between a man and a woman is a reflection of a profound mystery, Christ the groom. And church, and the church, his bride. Again, a beautiful picture of the gospel, the good news that Christ has made us, his church, holy, cleansing us from our sins, so that when he sees us, he's not seeing the dirt of our past, the stains of our sin, but instead the bright white perfection of the dress, his own righteousness that he places over us by grace. I had an overwhelming personal experience of this reality at my own wedding. As I stood up there on the altar watching my beautiful bride walk down the aisle dressed in white, well, hers was actually more off-white, but close enough, I was thinking about how Jesus sees us, his church, and what he did for us. Then there was this moment in the wedding when we were up there together, holding hands and looking at each other, and the song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us, was played. And I just broke down in tears. I had to pull out a napkin and start dabbing my eyes, and I told Emily what I was thinking, and she laughed at me. I think it was because it was uncommon for me to be so emotional, and here I was in front of a crowd of people crying. But it was like I was seeing it all before me, Christ and the church. So there's no bride mentioned in the parable, but in the actual wedding feast that awaits us in heaven, there is a bride, 
and she is us, the church. Okay, let's get back to the parable. So the king is God, and the son is Jesus. The first servants are the prophets, and those who had been invited to the banquet are the people of Israel, the Jewish people who refused to come, specifically the Pharisees and the chief priests that were there. Now, obviously, not all Jews rejected the invitation, as Jesus' first disciples, the first Christians, were Jews. But he's alluding to Israel's persistent rejection of its prophets and its unresponsiveness to God's repeated invitation. The second group of servants could again be referring to the Old Testament prophets, but it could also be understood to include New Testament prophets like John the Baptist and the disciples of Jesus. The abundant feast tells us of the goodness and generosity of God and his kingdom. The obvious question is, who in their right mind would refuse a seat at such a grand banquet? Again, an image or taste, if you will, of heaven in other places in the Bible as well. Isaiah, the Old Testament prophet, holds out the vision On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Did you catch the trade-off? It's a fabulous deal for us. The Lord by his grace, makes an amazing feast for us to eat and enjoy. And what does he eat? He takes the bitter pill that we deserve, death. He swallows up death forever through Christ. So the banquet is heaven, both here and now, inaugurated by Christ, but also the not yet fully realized glory That awaits us. Back to the parable. The second group of guests, the street riffraff, good and bad alike, who accept the invitation, are the sinners who repent and believe, both Jews and Gentiles. The inclusion of Gentiles at the exclusion of the chief priests and Pharisees would have been scandalous in their minds. They saw themselves, the chief priests, the religious leaders, as the chosen people of God the people of his covenant promises, going all the way back to Abraham. They thought that being chosen meant exclusive favor and blessing from God. They liked Genesis 12, chapter 2, God's call of Abraham, where he says, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great. But they forgot the next part. And you will be a blessing. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. You see, they're blessed, Israel is blessed, because from them would come the ultimate blessing for all people, for the whole world, namely Jesus Christ, and abundant eternal life in him. And then we come to the last part of the parable. That is a bit troubling at first glance. I mean, why does this poor guy get singled out, addressed as a friend of all things, and booted out into the darkness, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, which is a description of the final judgment of hell, eternal separation from God. I mean, is it really fair to expect him to have his best banquet threads ready to throw on over his grubby street clothes on a whim? Apparently, all the other sinners did. Well, the word friend, as used here, is actually a term of rebuke. And the wedding clothes that he's not wearing is a really big deal. Remember earlier when I talked about the bride of Christ, the church, wearing a fine white linen, which is a gift of righteousness received through Christ. It's the same idea here. The man had not put on the righteousness of Christ through faith. And in his own works, he was left speechless without excuse. That's how it is for all of us in our sinful condition. We don't deserve a seat at the banquet. Just as Jesus said in verse 8, those I invited did not deserve to come. 
We have all sinned and deserve death. We deserve hell. That's the truth for all of us. It's only by the grace of God through faith in Christ that we can be saved from the punishment of sin and accept the awesome invitation into Christ's kingdom. In baptism, we receive this grace, this cleansing and righteous clothing from the Holy Spirit. It is a gift. The last line of the parable is a doozy. For many are invited, but few are chosen. This leads to a difficult question that great theologians wrestle with. If salvation is a gift from God, not earned, even an ounce, to the point where on our own, without the Holy Spirit drawing us and illuminating us and baptizing us, we can't choose God, but rather He chooses us. Yet 2 Peter 3.9 is clear that God does not want anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So the age-old question then is, why are some saved and not others? Why are many invited, but few are chosen? In fact, many here can be translated as all or everyone. So all are invited, but few which isn't an indication of how many, as in a small number, but rather few as in not all are chosen or are part of the elect, which is a term that Matthew uses later in chapter 24 as shorthand for the disciples of Christ. In the context of this parable, it is pretty clear that those not chosen were given plenty of opportunities to come. It was their own refusal that left them out. Essentially, self-exclusion by rejecting Christ. So where does that leave us? While this parable was originally aimed at a specific group of people at a specific time, the chief priests and the Pharisees, it also applies to us today. The king is still extending his invitation to all to everyone. He wants you there at the wedding banquet. Like last week's parable and sermon, the message is urgent. Don't wait. Accept the invitation. Accept Christ now. Put on the wedding clothes of righteousness by faith. If you're not baptized and you want to be baptized, please talk to Pastor Matt about it. Don't put it off. Sadly, Many people today are like those in the parable who refuse the awesome invitation, opting instead for some lame excuse or trivial tasks. Of course, they don't think that. One went to his field, another to his business. Don't we still see that today? People pay little attention to God and his kingdom. They'd rather invest their time and resources building their own little earthly kingdoms that won't last working feverishly to get ahead, worshiping sports and celebrity entertainers, seeking temporary pleasures and amusements. People are deceived into thinking that this life is all there is, so live it up. Do whatever feels good now. They have a wrong view of the king, of God. They think he's a cosmic killjoy, or they think he doesn't care, or they think he doesn't even exist. We don't live in a monarchy, so we don't have a king here in the United States, but this parable made me think about how athletic teams that win championships are often invited to the White House to meet the president. What an honor, right? But not everyone thinks so. We've seen that when players don't agree with the politics of the president, they may refuse the invitation. It's not nearly the same magnitude as refusing God's invitation, but it helps us understand that when people don't like God or his word, for whatever reason, intellectual objections, moral objections, or their own experiential, they are against God. 
it makes sense that they wouldn't accept his invitation, no matter how great it is, until they have a new realization, a new experience, a transformational encounter with Christ in all his extravagant grace and truth. For those of us in the church who have accepted Christ's invitation by faith, we know that he is the one who has changed us. Maybe you had wrong ideas and incorrect beliefs about God at one time, but he met you there and invited you in. So there's always hope for the lost. And those of us who are part of the kingdom and have the privilege and joy of sharing the gospel, of inviting others to the banquet, we can't change their minds or their hearts. Only God can do that. But we can show them what Christ has done for us. And God can use us for his purposes. Remember, the main point of the parable is everyone is invited to the great feast of heaven. So, accept his generous offer, invitation through Christ and share the invitation with others today. I want to close with a short illustration of what this has looked like from my life. I'm a Chicago Cubs fan. <clears throat> Not really a diehard fan anymore. I used to be more so. Here's a custom bobblehead of me as a Cubs fan that my wife got for me as a gift many years ago. I'm holding a Coke bottle in it. Well, despite being a fan, I never really went to many games, but there was one time that I'll never forget about. My brother invited me to go with him to the Cubs game, but not just any seats. He had Skybox tickets, but it wasn't his Skybox. My brother, knew a wealthy and generous doctor from where he lived in Texas and worked at Bible Study Fellowship headquarters. This Texas doctor was also a Cubs fan to the point where he had a private airplane that would fly him to Chicago for games and of course he often had a skybox. So the doctor told my brother that he could invite a few people to the skybox and my brother invited me. The doctor didn't even know me. Here I was, treated to an amazing spread of food and an uber sweet sweet, and it was all completely free to me. There was even a dessert cart that came by, and I remember he said to get whatever I wanted. So I picked out several desserts. That's my weakness, sweets. This doctor friend of my brother, he loved the Lord Jesus. He was so kind and generous. I remember thinking, this is a picture of the kingdom of heaven. What it's like to invite others to join us at the feast. It's so good. And it's all provided by Jesus. It's like he's giving us tickets to the skybox saying, go ahead and hand them out to everyone. All are welcome. Everything is ready, come to the banquet. Amen. Well, good morning, Lord of Life. My name is Greg Deem. I'm one of the seven elders here at Lord of Life Church. Pastor, thank you for your sermon, and thank you always to our praise team. They really lift our spirits. I'd like to talk a little bit about my mother-in-law. Her name was Dolores Casting. Uh, we laid her to rest on Tuesday to join her husband, Donald, who the Lord accepted him 35 years ago, and she remained faithful to him all these years. She was a very positive woman, always looked for the most positive thing in people, not the negative, which really seems to be different from the world today. At any rate, she was a lifetime member of St. Peter's Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod in Schaumburg, which was founded in 1847. She was baptized there and attended school there through the eighth grade. May God rest her soul. Now let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, you have removed the ultimate sting of death by your resurrection victory over death and the grave. By the sting of death is still painful for us as we grieve for our impending loss. 
In your hands, O oh Lord, we humbly entrust our brothers and sisters. In this life, we embrace them with your tender love. Deliver them now from every evil and bid them eternal rest. The old order has passed away. Welcome them into paradise, where there will be no sorrow, no weeping or pain, but fullness of peace and joy with your Son and the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Heavenly Father, we come to you with heavy hearts, praying for the peace in the land of Israel, a, a place of deep significance for many Christians. Lord, you are the God of peace, and we ask for your divine intervention in the midst of conflicts and tensions. We pray for the people of Israel and Palestine, that they may experience the true peace that comes from you. Bring an end to violence, hatred, discord. discord. Replace fear with trust, animosity into reconciliation, and despair and hope, with hope. Lord, we ask for wisdom and compassion for the leaders of the region. Guide them towards paths of justice and peace. May they work to find common ground and lasting solutions that benefit all. We pray for the families and individuals who are affected by these conflicts, that they might find safety, comfort, and assurance in your presence. Protect those in harm's way and provide for all the needs of the vulnerable. Lord, let your peace, which surpasses all understanding, prevail in this region of the world. We entrust this prayer into your hands, knowing that with you all things are possible. In the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen.